Okay. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, or even good night, depending on which part of the world you are watching. Um, my name is uh, Jan Velis. Uh, I'm located in Ghent in Belgium, and I will be your host uh, for this webinar together with my colleagues behind me, uh, Dr. Fred Bos and also Professor Christian Lauter. Welcome at the Challenging Glass 7 webinar. Challenging Glass has already a long-standing tradition and a solid reputation of quality in structural glass. Um, we had hoped, in fact, to welcome you here in, in person today uh, in Ghent in Belgium, in the historical city and in the historical monastery here uh, at Pant, where we are standing right now. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we had to change our plans but we were actually very happy to come up with a webinar, um, which by the way, will be recorded. And uh, we are quite confident that we have a quite uh, in interesting uh, program for uh, the coming hours. Uh, roughly the program looks as follows. After the opening words of uh, us as, uh, let's say the, the hosts, we will have a warm welcome from our platinum sponsors. Uh, this will be followed by a keynote lecture of Chikara Inamura. Um, and then we will have a selection of author pitches uh, from the papers which are in our proceedings. Um, and uh, after that, there will also be a, a possibility for discussion. Um, we, uh, we intend to use the chat function for that to have a certain interaction with you, uh, but we will come back to that later also. After this discussion, uh, we will have, let's say, the best paper award of the Glass Structures and Engineering Journal. And uh, then we will have the, the final closing words. We expect to finish in about two hours from now. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the webinar quite a lot. Also a very warm welcome uh, on my behalf. Uh, my name is Christian Lauter. I'm professor of building construction at uh, TU Dresden. And I have the honor to introduce you uh, our proceedings. Uh, like previous, previous times, we have been able to uh, publish proceedings, uh, which are published completely online. So you can find uh, the link to the proceedings at challengingglass.com. Uh, this edition, we have received uh, 70 paper contributions. Uh, 50 of those papers we have published in collaboration with uh, TU Delft Open. And that follows the open access uh, policy. So completely open uh, to be downloaded free of charge. Next to that, we have also uh, been again able to uh, publish with um, uh, Springer with the Glass Structures and Engineering Journal, where we have published uh, 20 uh, papers related to the conference. Um, so you can find the link on the website. Uh, there you find then all the, the read and the download links to the separate papers. Uh, most papers have been released, uh, but there are some pending that will appear over the next weeks. But we will make sure to inform you about that uh, when they appear. Um, we would like to thank all the authors uh, for, of course, submitting that paper, for revising that paper, despite these times of uh, Corona. And we would like to thank the scientific committee members and also the other reviewers that have been uh, reviewing our, the papers um, for their valuable contribution. As mentioned later in this webinar, we present a cross section of, this, uh, of these uh, proceedings uh, through selected paper pitches. Uh, but for now, I would like to say, enjoy reading the proceedings. Uh, hello, my name is Fake Bos. I'm an assistant professor at the TU Eindhoven at the moment. And uh, I also say welcome on my behalf. I'm really glad that you are showing up in such large numbers. Actually, at the moment, I feel we're already way over 250. So that's a really good turn up. Thank you, everybody. Um, there's a particular word of uh, thanks that I want to aim at our sponsors. Uh, it was already mentioned, these are special times with uh, ever-changing uh, focus and, and format uh, of events. And that is also for this event, uh, we had to change actually twice uh, before we ended up with this current format. And we are really glad that uh, in that in those times, uh, our sponsors have uh, stood by us. And that I think it shows their commitment, not only to our conference, but also to the structural glass community as a whole. I think it's really important. 
Um, what is uh, maybe extra special is that uh, even after changing to this webinar format, we've managed to uh, involve uh, even more sponsors. So I think the community is uh, very well alive and kicking despite these uh, sometimes difficult uh, times. Um, so um, we have a total of uh, 10 sponsors. Our platinum sponsors are Saint-Gobain and Eastman. We have gold sponsors, Bellapart, Dow, Seen, Tosifol. And we have our silver sponsors, Irox, Oct Octatube, Permasalisa, and Vitroplena. And uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for uh, supporting this event. Um, as Jan already mentioned, uh, the webinar will now be kicked off by a word of, uh, from our platinum sponsors. First up is Francis Serruis of Saint-Gobain. He's been a uh, director of technical sales, uh, support and business development uh, over there. He has been working in the uh, glass world for more than 30 years already uh, and has been involved uh, in a multitude of projects really around the world. He has also worked at the Research and Development Center uh, in France, uh, where he was at the basis of several new uh, solutions for glass facades. Um, so Francis, if you're there, we would like to give the word and the virtual floor, as I say, to you. I can see you. And um, so we ask our host to start the uh, presentation so that Francis can take over. Okay, floor is yours, Francis. Thank you. Uh, I must say, uh, uh, with this uh, high number of, uh, of participants, that uh, Saint Gobain is really a, a proud sponsor and proud to be a platinum sponsor for the seventh uh, uh, Challenging Glass Conference. Uh, Saint Gobain is a, a major global company and uh, a leader in uh, all its activities, uh, whether it is global or European, and uh, we are present in uh, 67 countries around the world. Uh, saint Gobain is a well-appreciated supplier of building materials, um, including glass for uh, major and iconic projects. But uh, very interesting is that uh, uh, saint Gobain's group strategy is focuses on the environment and innovation. The 2050 goal of Saint-Gobain is very clear, it's to achieve a net zero carbon uh, emission. And to reach this goal, uh, innovation is uh, uh, very important. And uh, with eight cross R&D business centers, Saint-Gobain belongs to the top 100 uh, innovators. Uh, innovation in the industry goes uh, hand in hand with the uh, uh, research done on academic level. So, and uh, that's why Saint Gobain supports uh, actively the Challenging Glass Conference uh, to give, among others, young academic researchers uh, a forum to uh, present their uh, their work. So, leading to a more intense collaboration between industry and universities. Um, finally, I just want to wish uh, uh, the organizers and especially the presenters a very successful conference webinar. And uh, I hope, I most probably like you do, that we can all meet in 2022 for the eighth challenging class. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Francis. Uh, yes, I can only say we second that uh, we hope to be able to uh, have a physical conference again, an on-location conference. Uh, in two years time and we hope to see you all there in person. Um, for now, thank you very much again for continuing to support Challenging Glass um, and um, then I would like to move on to our other platinum sponsor. Wim Stevels is here to present Eastman. Uh, he's responsible for technical support on use of Eastman, Saflex and Franceva interlayers in the architectural area in Europe. He's a member of uh, CEN committees on, committees on laminated glass and design of glass structures and involved with product registration and qualification testing in the region. Um, he is especially interested in interlayer rheology and glass design and has been speaking on uh, these topics at events like the GPD and uh, Glasscom Global and of course here at Challenging Glass. So Wim, are you there? I'm there. Thank you, Freik. Can you hear okay. me all right? Go ahead. Thank you. So on behalf of Eastman, I would like to thank you for participating in this year's online challenging conference. Eastman is a Fortune 500 specialty materials company 
with a 2019 revenue of approximately 10 billion. Since 2012, we have embarked on a journey to transform from a diversified chemical company to a specialty materials company. And today we manufacture and market advanced materials and specialty additives. Eastman supplies a complete range of PVB interlayers to the glass transformation industry under our Safelex and Vanceva interlayer brands. Eastman is proud to be a sponsor of Challenging Glass and we appreciate everyone for working through a very difficult 2020. Despite all the challenges, the glass industry by and large remained open for business. That is a staggering accomplishment and something we can all be proud of. We have all reinvented the way we work, serve customers, and we learned to merge our professional lives with our personal ones. Innovating the use of glass in architectural design has always been at the core of the Challenging Glass Conference. As we start to move beyond the first phase of the 2020 global health crisis, it is important to continue to get inspired and to meet challenges in glass and in society. In a way, this online conference is a token of a new beginning for us all. Let's get inspired and explore the future. Back to you guys. Thank you very much, Wim, uh, and also Francis for your, your introductory words. Uh, we are, of course, very grateful for our platinum, gold, and silver sponsors to support us, us also in these uh, difficult times, which made us possible to organize this webinar and also to publish the proceedings in its current form. Well, with these introductory words, we come to the uh, keynote of today, of today's webinar. And it's a pleasure and my honor to introduce to you um, Shikira Inomara. Um, Shikira Inomara is a designer, an engineer, and the founder of Vitra, uh, Vitri AM, which is a startup company in additive manufacturing of glass. Um, he is also co-inventor of the glass additive manufacturing technology that was developed at the Mediated Matter um, uh, Group in, uh, at, the, uh, at MIT. Uh, where he was the project lead uh, for research and development on glass additive manufacturing. Before joining uh, MIT, uh, Shikira was a lead structural engineer at uh, Sasaki and Partners in Tokyo and has been a lead designer at Zaha Hadid Architects in London. Shikira is calling in today from Los Angeles, where it's now about quarter past six, I suppose. So thank you very much for calling in so early, uh, Shikra, and we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. Um, it is a great pleasure to be speaking at this year's Challenging Glass Conference, especially at this time under the global pandemics and environmental crisis. It is an incredible opportunity to share this moment with everyone in this conference. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank the conference organizers, Professor Bers, Dr. Voss, and Professor Lauter, as well as the conference sponsors for their time and effort in enabling this year's conference through this webinar. Today, I will talk about the recent advancement in additive manufacturing in the AEC industry and share some of my research in the field of AM technology for glass. Mechanically strong, optically transparent, and chemically not. Glass has long kept us attracted ever since the Stone Age. Originally produced by Mother Earth through the volcanic extrusion, mankind has slowly learned to produce glass over the last 4,000 years. Egyptian has, long, Egyptian has first discovered the ingredients of glass and developed the process of molding to make jewelry and tableware. Romans have developed the process of glass growing and Venetians have defined this method and discovered the recipe for transparency. The 19th century saw the birth of modern glass chemistry, and the 20th century brought the industrialization of glass manufacturing through the invention of Pilkington flow glass technology. Each innovation in glass making has brought significant values in our society and completely re-rendered our built environment. 
It is worth noting that the construction of the crystal, crystal palace on the left precedes the industrialization of glass making and the entire 294,000 glass panels were produced by hand using the cylindrical method that is an extension of glass growing. Pilkington technology is only 60 years old since, it's, since it was first commercialized, yet it covers 90% of the global production of flat glass panels we see today. With this industrialization, over 130 million metric tons of glass is produced globally. And this industry is responsible for 50 million metric tons of CO2 emission each year. In the United States, 10 million metric tons of glass is disposed of every year and 33% of this gets recycled. This is significantly lower compared to some of the European nations where the glass gets recycled over 90%. Through the reduction of consumption in raw materials, processing energy and transportation, 5% of CO2 energy can be cut by every 10% of recycled glass used in glass making. Glass is 100% recyclable and recent advancement in AM technology may hold the key for greater sustainability and the circular economy through the continuous repurposing of glass. The Here you go. Sorry about that. Um, the American Society of Testing and Materials classifies additive manufacturing technology in the following seven categories. VAT photopolymerization, which utilizes the VAT of photopolymer to, and UV light to print, 3D, <coughs> to print 3D object layer by layer. Powder bed fusion, which utilizes a bed of material in the powder format and utilizes a laser to sinter each layer. Binder gelling, which also utilizes a better material in a powder format, but utilizes an adhesive agent to bind the material. Material gelling, which deposits the material along the UV light to print and cure each layer. Sheet lamination, which utilizes a combination of additive and subtractive methods to create a 3D object from a set of 2D layers. Material extrusion, which extrudes the material in the filament format and construct a 3D object one layer at a time. And the direct energy deposition, which extrudes the material either as a filament or powder format and utilize laser to sinter them. Here are some of the recent advancements in AM technology across the range of materials from thermoplastics and concrete to metal and glass, and from robotics and gantry systems to mobile platform and desktop printers. The use of AM technology in the AAC industry is growing exponentially across scales and materials. For instance, AI built based in London is focusing on the development of large scale material extrusion systems for, therm for thermoplastics using a robotic arm and computer vision. Mighty Buildings based in San Francisco develops a large scale hybrid system of material extrusion and photopolymerization of a thermoplastics with a gantry platform to 3D print an entire shed of the lightweight affordable dwelling units. MX3D based in Netherlands develops a large scale metal 3D printing system using a mobile direct energy deposition platform, which is essentially an autonomous metal welding system that produces large scale load bearing structures. 3D system based in South Carolina, in collaboration with Arap in London, develops a complex metal structural joints using topology optimizations and the powder bed fusion system. Digital construction platform developed by the Mediated Matter Group at MIT Media Lab is a large scale mobile material extrusion system that prints an expandable polyurethane form to produce a double layer formwork in which concrete is poured and together acts as an insulated concrete unit. Icon built based in Austin, Texas, develops a large scale concrete 3D printing platform using a gantry based material extrusion system that was originally developed by Dr. Koshnavitz at USC. 
Carl Zrahe Institute of Technology in Germany develops a nanocomposite material made of a monomer and silicon dioxide particle and utilizes bat photopolymerization to 3D print the 3D printed transparent glass. The mediated matter glue at the MIT Media Lab develops a high temperature material extrusion system using a molten glass that produces a transparent glass with a mechanical strength on par with solar line window glass. Six years ago, we started developing this new additive manufacturing technology for glass. This was a joint research between the Mediated Matter Group at MIT Media Lab and the MIT Glass Lab at the Department of Material Science and Engineering. This was the first prototype we built. The system is composed of three thermal zones that are independently thermally controlled to melt the glass nuggets and retain molten glass, to regulate its flow, and to remove the thermal stress through the annealing of printed glass. The upper assembly of the melter and the nozzle moves in X and Y directions, and the print bed moves in Z direction inside a heated chamber. Glass chemistry plays an important role in determining the control parameter for each thermal zone. We use the commercially available solar line glass nuggets called System 96 at the time. The gla glass composition is similar to the solar line window glass, but has an additional additives that provides an ex extra brightness and longer working range suitable for glass blowing. Based on the glass composition, the viscosity, viscosity curve and the glass transition temperature were determined using a BFT equation. And based on the viscosity curve, the target temperature at the nozzle, tip, at the nozzle was determined around 970C to match the working point, working point temperature of this glass. CFD analysis was conducted to account for the thermal loss and the thermal imaging was used to validate the spot temperatures. The system is gravity based and the flow rate of molten glass is determined based on the head, head pressure <coughs> in the reservoir and the flow resistance in the reservoir nozzle assembly. Preliminary me mechanical characterizations were conducted on printed glass samples. It is known that uh, material extrusion methods sometimes result in objects with non-isotropic strengths with respect to the direction of filament and cause the object to delaminate at the layer interface. This was also the case for our earlier, prototype, pro <coughs> earlier pro products when the glass was printed without a lower thermal chamber. With the introduction of the annealing chamber, the results shows fairly isotropic mechanical behavior with a nominal tensile strength of 40 megapascal. Confirming that the result is a monolithic, glass, monolithic solid glass. We presented the collection of the first prototypes at the lobby of the Media Lab back in 2015. Printed glass objects have a beta texture as a result of this extrusion process. This texture presents a unique opportunity for designing a dynamic illumination. Each layer of printed glass has a convex surface on both sides that acts as an optical lens and refocuses the incoming light through refraction. By adding a single point light source above each printed glass, the products produce a highly intricate and dynamic illumination made of an overlay of acoustics. Being able to control the lighting through the computational design is a clear advantage of 3D printing transparent glass. Interesting phenomena were observed during this research. These two products on the left were printed in the exact same parameters. One is continuous and the other shows a distinct spiral patterns. Closer observation on the bottom face of the nozzle revealed 
a non-asymmetric adhesion of glass. Molten glass is extremely viscous, and this asymmetric adhesion at the nozzle causes an effective shear force to vary along the path and cause differential deposition. Furthermore, a close examination of the initial products also revealed consistent deviation at the inflection point of every curvature. This is likely caused by a twisting of a molten glass filament. The internal capillary force of molten glass provides an ability to relax the external shear and torsional force applied to it. But once this external force exceeds the capillary force, it will no longer retain its original shape and the product will deviate from its original path. Based on these findings, we decided to build a new industrial platform, a platform capable of producing glass products for structural applications at greater volume, precision, and repeatability. We introduced a force axis rotation along the nozzle to control the dynamic shear and torsional force. We also decoupled the thermal and motion control systems to improve the, improve the overall stability and, and accuracy of the product. This new platform was develop, developed, <coughs> developed at the Media Lab and deployed at the local glass studio called uh, Almost Perfect Glass. The platform also incorporates a digitally controlled concentric heat burner and chiller to initiate and terminate the flow. The control of three summer zones are connected through a single digital interface. And the owner couple of the studio and the resident glass artist were extremely supportive and we began collaborating on production of glass products. With this, we achieved a consistency across a greater range of curvature and precision. Glass is hard and brittle and the lack of ductility makes it prone to stress concentration. The ability to produce a consistent and reliable wall thickness across the range of curvature ensures that we can minimize such content stress concentration. We also achieved pre precision at significantly greater volume. The new printer is capable of producing glass at a maximum of one cubic foot in volume and 20 kilo in mass. Speed-wise, it prints approximately seven and, seven and a half kilo per hour. Glass is also in, inherently inhomogeneous and its effective strength for structural application is statistically determined based on the large sample data. So we began collaborating with the material science and engineering laboratory at the Simpson Gunpowder and Heger to conduct a series of mechanical and material characterizations of printed glass. When vertically loaded, the printed glass products carries up to 350,000 pounds in compression Normalized, normalized to the cross section area, this equals to about 150 megapascal. This is, a, this is a great value, but still much lower than the compressive strength of the soda line glass or the critical buckling load of the fixture geometry. We conducted a finite element analysis to examine this behavior and identify that uh, the critical limit was triggered based on the tensile stress that was induced by the bending at the boundary condition. We decided to build a glass column, a large scale freestanding structure with an integrate, integrated lighting system to manifest the novelty of the material and the capability of the new additive manufacturing system. One of the advantages of additive manufacturing is that we can harness the computational design to digitally control the spatial allocation of material without the limitation of a traditional manufacturing process. However, it does have its own limitation based on the material properties. And in this case, the viscosity of a glass dictates the parameters such as the maximum drafting angle, minimum turning radius, wall thickness, and layer height. So we, we built a parametric framework to explore the design space and to take the curvature on one axis and the area moment of inertia on the other axis. This enables us to explore the various design options that optimize the material allocations. 
based on the sectional properties desired for the freestanding columns. With the consideration of additional lateral load to pre prevent the overturn when person leans against it. We built a mock-up at the lobby of the media lab and examined the construction process and the structural behavior of this glass column. The column is made of uh, 15 unique components that are vertically assembled. Self-leveling transparent silicon adhesive was applied on one side of each, each component to provide a dampening layer and prevent the stress concentration, stress concentration at, at the interface. The assembly is then post-tensioned with the two steel plates at the top and bottom of the column that are connected with a steel shaft inside the column. Wireless load cell is installed at the top interface to monitor the press stress and the creeping of the silicon over the course of installation. A motorized LED system is installed inside a column and the press stress shaft is also utilized as a guide rail for the LED system to travel up and down. We received a commission from Lexus to design an exhibition for the Milan Design Week in 2017. So we designed and produced three more glass columns and installed on site at the Triennale Design Museum. Each column has a unique geometry coupled with an internal lighting system that is controlled remotely to modulate its intensity and position. The exhibition space turns from a full darkness to brightness with the ever-changing landscape of light filled with unique caustics that are radiating and contracting from each column. This was the first time that 3D printed glass structure were installed in public. Additive manufacturing is a rapidly growing field of science, engineering, and technology and we have just begun to experience its value across the AEC industry. Through localized on-demand production and expansive design space, AM technology brings the power of industrial manufacturing back to our hand. Considering the full recyclability of glass, we have an incredible opportunity and responsibility to shape the future of glass manufacturing through the creative applications that harness the value of this material and actively promotes the circular economy for the sustainable built environment. This project was developed by the Mediated Matter Group at MIT Media Lab in collaboration with the MIT Glass Lab at the Department of Material Science and Engineering, together with the MIT Department of Mechanical Engineering and Harvard Vis Institute. Additional supports were made by the Almost Perfect Glass and Simpson Gumpers and Higer for production and testing, Front Inc. and Pentagon for their support in the installation, and MIT Media Lab, Mori Building, Lexus and Getty Lab for their support through generous fundings. I'd like to end this keynote with a special thanks to my advisor, Professor Nelly Oxman from the media, <coughs> MIT Media Lab and Director Peter Haug from the MIT Glass Lab, as well as the incredible team of researchers at MIT. From material scientists to mechanical engineers, structural engineers, software and electrical engineers, architects and glass artists. This innovation was a product of a unique research collaboration across disciplines. And these are the designers, engineers, scientists, artists, whose passion for glass made this project possible. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'd like to open up for a brief Q&A and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Shikara, for this inspiring talk. Very fascinating what you can already do with 3D printing of glass today. Uh, we have received some questions, so uh, we can go to this Q&A directly indeed. Um, first question from uh, Sophie Penache. Um, have you tried to print on soda lime silica uh, glass sheets? So print on a glass sheet to, for instance, stiffen it? Yes, uh, we, have a, we have tested a couple of those. Um, 
And also, uh, we began uh, speaking with uh, uh, researchers um, who's, who's developing uh, 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 what they call uh, uh, glass welding uh, of uh, solar, solar line window sheets. Um, it is technically feasible, um, uh, so long as we elevate the temperature of uh, solar line glass windows or window panels uh, up to uh, close to working point temperature before we deposit the molten glass. Otherwise, it will cause a thermal shock. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, then we have received some questions about the column that you showed. Uh, first question up from uh, Jan Beles here from the floor. Um, when you compose these glass columns and you stack them together, the independent uh, pieces, um, how do you then avoid uh, contact stresses of high peak stresses between those panels or between those pieces? Yes, there's about uh, uh, close to one millimeter thick uh, uh, silicon adhesive um, that was meant to uh, bond two glass together, but then we wanted to keep it modular. So we ended up applying it on one layer and let it cure um, so that it remains uh, uh, somewhat ductile. Uh, so that added uh, a dampening layer to avoid this uh, a contact stress. Okay, yes. And then uh, related to this column again, uh, did you do some experiments on columns like these uh, under uh, soft body impact? So somebody falling against this, this column, for instance? Yes, yes. So that uh, uh, we engineer this such that uh, uh, you can lean against it um, up to uh, 50 kilo of lateral load. So it's basically equivalent of sort of engineering a, a handrail um, for the balusters in, in staircase and so on. Um, uh, mostly those were uh, Done in association with the steel plates at the bottom, which which acts against the uh, 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 overtime moment. Okay, um, that question was actually asked by uh, Chiara Bedon. Forgot to mention that. Uh, also related to the glass column, a uh, question from uh, Paul Fouton. Um, does the shape of the glass column uh, only follow design purposes, or is there also uh, a mechanical resistance purpose uh, related to the shape that you have designed there? Yes. Uh, so as a cross section continues to sort of bifurcate itself uh, to increase the sectional properties uh, uh, from top to bottom, um, uh, we gain a little over three times higher um, area moment of inertia at the bottom compared to the top sections, uh, uh, as well as the weight uh, uh, increase from around seven kilo at the top all the way down to uh, 16 kilo at the bottom bottom components. Um, so it's designed to lower the uh, um, center of gravity as well as increase the area moment of inertia where we need it. Okay, so that's, that follows the mechanical principles there. Um, then another question from uh, Fedra Ikenoglu. Uh, how long does it take to annul the 3D printed glass elements uh, within the chamber? Um, um, for, how, for instance, how long did it take to print and annul the uh, one segment of the glass column? So the one segment, uh, the nominal weight is around 10 kilo. Um, that gets printed uh, a little over one hour. Um, 60 to 75 minutes or so. Um, so that's very quick. But then annealing process uh, overall takes uh, about eight hours. Hmm. And do we, what, what, how many kilos was one segment again? I think you mentioned. Uh, around 10 kilo. Right. It varies from seven kilo to 15 kilo. So eight hours for kneeling, 10 kilo. Right. Um, uh, Peter Lenk asked about how do you maintain the dimensional stability during the printing? Uh, and what is then the tolerance of the product in the end? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, overall, uh, we achieved uh, within 10% of uh, a dimensional accuracy from uh, uh, input design. Um, the nominal cross section is about uh, uh, a 10 millimeter, 10 to 12 millimeter, and uh, uh, thermal accounts for about 0.5 millimeter and the motion accounts for additional 0.5 millimeter. So in total, um, plus minus 
one millimeter. Okay, that's uh, relatively accurate. I'm looking at some more questions. Um, perhaps um, there are two or three questions which are combined in one. Um, comes from uh, Sophia Stangel and also from Michael Dras. Um, so where do you see the future of uh, 3D printing in building construction? Can we use it as a load bearing element and perhaps what kind of element is there then? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, as we saw that the glass is a strong material, um, although it doesn't have a, a ductility, so we won't be able to use it for structure that needs to absorb and take on a lot of energy post the yielding. But uh, uh, for instance, uh, simple pin joint columns, uh, glass is a perfect solution. Also, uh, one of the things that uh, we began discussing back then uh, with Professor Oxman is that uh, uh, we mentioned that the, we, mentioned, we mentioned the three distinct properties of a glass. Um, mechanical strength, optical transparency, and chemical inertness. We, we believe that we managed to address at least the two of those, the mechanical part and optical part, but we haven't quite touched the, the chemical part yet. Um, the chemical stability is what's been utilized for a lot of uh, chemical engineering and, and uh, uh, biomedical industries. Um, so, uh, Perhaps harnessing the mechanical part and optical part together with chemical, uh, we may be able to design something um, for like macro and microfluidics device. Um, and ideally, in, co in combination with solar energy, we may be able to create something that sort of generates the energy through light. Uh, thank you. Um, we have a couple of other questions. I think I will uh, pick out one last one for now. Perhaps we can continue later in this Q&A session with some more questions uh, to you. Um, a technical question from uh, Katinka Ferlech. Um, is it hard to prevent the printed glass to be full of air bubbles? So, And if so, how do you prevent the glass to be uh, uh, with air bubbles inside? Um, Eventually, uh, we optimize the process by uh, melting the glass in, in a separate uh, furnace, which takes care of the removable or, or the bubbles. Um, if, if, if the glass has any contaminations, uh, it will create bubbles. And in the earlier phase, we have experienced a lot of air bubbles uh, because of the chemical reaction with some of the components we were using at the joint between uh, the glass reservoir and the nozzle. Um, so we slowly started to identify those uh, components and remove them. And, and eventually the, all the products became uh, bubble free. Okay, thank you very much. I'm tempted to, to ask one other question, actually. Uh, coming in from George Hidalgo. Um, if you would use uh, 3D printed glass as a structural element, how can we then make it uh, safe? So how then can we provide some post-fracture performance or redundancy? Is there any... Um, that? Yes. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I, I guess the one easier answer would be to to let's say dope the printed glass into polymers uh, to assign a ductility. Let's imagine that we print a double wall structure and then uh, uh, pour the polymer in between. Then it will provide a ductility, uh, much like a laminated glass. But uh, the challenge associated with that is that uh, uh, it will make the printed glass unrecyclable. And, and I think one of the key advantages of printing glass is that uh, we, can, we can truly address this recyclability of a glass by continuously repurposing um, and redesigning a glass. So to do that, we may need to address an alternative method of, of providing a ductility if desirable. Um, so I don't have a clear answer to that yet, but then I think if, if one needs immediate solutions, then I think polymer would be a, 
good solution. Okay, an open topic for uh, further studies. That's always interesting. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for now for your keynote and for answering these questions. Perhaps we uh, have a chance to answer more questions in the next uh, Q&A session. Uh, but for now, I would like to thank you again for your keynote and uh, for joining us so early morning from LA. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. With that, we come uh, to the next part of our uh, webinar, um, which is involving uh, the pitches. Uh, for that, I would like to ask the host to um, start the presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we cannot present, of course, all papers that we have received uh, in the proceedings, um, but we would like to show you or highlight the proceedings by uh, some short pitches that we have selected. Uh, which provides you a cross-section of the uh, proceedings. So the proceedings are addressing a multitude of uh, topics uh, from which we have selected five now to show you today. And these are then intended to inspire you uh, to read the full proceedings. And as I said earlier, you can download them or access them from challengingglass.com. So 50 papers directly from TU Delft Open published and another 20 papers in uh, collaboration with uh, Springer Glass Structures and Engineering Journal. Uh, then we come to the first pitch, um, which is about the looking glass, a complex uh, curved storefront, uh, done uh, presented today by Chris Notenboom from Arup and Iris Rombouts from Octitube. Uh, Chris Notenboom is a structural engineer at Arup um, and provides lectures on structural glass at TU Delft. He is a specialist in glass and steel structure and is part of the Arab Glass Network. Uh, before Arab, he also worked at uh, Octatube, which is a specialized uh, facade contractor. And he worked uh, there and perhaps also later on the Markthal in Rotterdam and the entrance of um, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. The dual speaker is uh, Iris Rombout. She is from Octatube also then, um, where Chris worked before. Uh, she's a structural engineer and project manager there, and uh, both of them have been involved in this project, uh, the Looking Glass, which they are going to present to you today. So, Chris and Iris, if you are ready, then I would like to invite you to start your pitch. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you, um, Christian. Thank you. So, good afternoon, all. Um, so thank you all for joining. This pitch is about a co uh, complex curved storefront in Amsterdam uh, that the architect UN Studio named the Looking Glass. I'm Chris Noetwam from Arab, and I was lead engineer um, for the design and calculation of the facade. Um, the paper was written together with Iris Rombout and Erik van der Tiel from facade contractor Octitube and with my Arab London colleague, Peter Lenk. This facade is very special to me as I was involved from the initial sketches to the final completion. And it's quite challenging now to present the four years in only four minutes. What makes this facade special uh, is most of all its geometry with curves in all directions. Uh, this resulted in challenging and complex calculation and construction with 15 curved glass elements. For a minimalistic look, the facade has structural glue joints in combination with high quality stainless steel. The details really show craftsmanship. We came up with a smart solution that allowed the facade to be pre-assembled in the factory for optimal quality and to be constructed in only two days. The facade UN Studio made a unique design that resembles billowing clothes, a perfect fit for the expensive shopping street where the facade is located. If I look at the facade, I don't see only one, but even three nice glass ladies. Look for it yourself. These three photos show the facade in all its glory. The center one even shows that the facade is cantilevering from the neighboring buildings and to reveal itself also from a distance. We spend a lot of time uh, in the design of especially the corner detail um, where two curved glass elements connect. And in the end, we incorporate a stainless steel section uh, in all joints and it protects then the glass and it also accentuates the curvature. One person famously said, that the glass and steel elements look like giant iPhones. And I think that's exactly right. Mainly glass and just a bit of steel at the right location. Um, at the right, you see the concept of a steel and glass box we also used for uh, constructability. 
Of course, the design process was sometimes difficult. Uh, we had good uh, uh, collaboration with the architect of the facade contractor, Oxitube. We optimized in the end uh, risks and uh, cost. After a lot of engineering by Oxitube 2, the steel and glass boxes were assembled in their factory. And I will now hand over to Iris. Um, she was structural engineer and project manager for the facade from Oxitube. Was also key in the success of this facade. Floor is yours, Iris. Thank you. If we can go to the next slide. Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, as you heard, all glass elements are surrounded by stainless steel. Uh, due to its complex shape and the very tight tolerances, the production of the stainless steel elements required craftsmanship. To manage the complex shapes with that tight tolerances, we made a lot of 3D molds, as you can see on this slide. The next slide shows the time lapse we made of our pre assembly. So we started with structural gluing of the stainless steel element to all glass fins. After that, uh, the glass elements were connected to a steel perimeter structure one by one and combined with all other stainless steel elements, which you can see here. And then later, a lot of clamps were placed in between the stainless steel and the glass to create the silicon joint detail with the, which Chris mentioned, together with the tight tolerances. Subsequently, everything was structurally glued together. As you can see, we assembled the boxes horizontally and to transport them to site and in particular rotate them to vertical, we made an extra steel frame. This frame was protecting the glass boxes and prevented them to deflect with all its consequences. So we managed to install the elements in the end in two days. And here you can see the beautiful result. So to summarize, the facade features unique curved glass, structural glue joints, stainless steel craftsmanship, a pre-assembly for optimal quality and a two-day installation on site. And we're all very proud of it. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris and uh, Iris for this uh, nice presentation of this very uh, nice project. Um, as you know, questions will be taken, let's say at the end of all uh, the pitches. So have, be a little patient, but to the audience, if you have more questions, do not hesitate. Okay. Um, the next topic uh, which we have selected uh, is uh, a topic which we believe is quite novel and uh, will gain importance quite significantly in the future in our field. Um, it is about artificial intelligence in particular for uh, structural glass engineering applications. And the specialist coming to explain us uh, is Dr. Michael Krauss. Um, Dr. Michael, Michael Krauss is a civil engineer from, uh, yeah, graduated from the Technical University in uh, Munich. And um, he later on in 2019 received his PhD on the application of artificial intelligence in the material model of polymeric interlayers in laminated glass, as well as on the prediction of the fracture pattern of thermally toughened glass. Since 2011, he has also been working as a freelance in structural engineering. And uh, quite recently, he expanded his field of activity with the foundation of m, &M Network Engineer. And uh, in 2019, uh, he did that together with Dr. Michael Drass. And uh, since January 2020, Dr. Krauss is a postdoc uh, researching the integration of artificial intelligence to computational mechanics at Stanford University in the US. And uh, from October 2020 this year, he will be joining the ETH in Zurich as a postdoc also for artificial intelligence in computer, computational mechanics and structural engineering. So Michael, I hope you're ready. We are looking forward to your pitch. Good luck. Thank you, Jan, for the introduction. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you heard it already. My name is uh, Michael Kraus, and uh, on behalf of my partner, Dr. Michael Truss, and me, I send the warmest welcomes to you. 
Um, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence for structural glass engineering um, applications. Before we do so, uh, I would like to pose a question. So do you think that the glass industry is ready for AI and vice versa? Let me begin with uh, just a short uh, introduction to our uh, startup m, &M networking. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the picture of my partner, Dr. Michael Drass. Uh, yeah, he obtained his PhD last year at uh, TU Darmstadt. And then the left hand side, you can see me, uh, Dr. Michael Kraus. Together, we founded our startup m, &M networking in the last year. And uh, as already heard, our mission is to bring AI applications into the building industry via projects and seminars and conferences like this. So we all know AI, uh, AI uh, already from our everyday life. Examples are the Apple Siri, Amazon Alexa, or the self-driving car. But actually the research on AI was started back in the early 20th century. And AI is an umbrella term for a number of subdisciplines. For our context in the glass industry, we will only need machine and deep learning algorithms. And this is of interest for us. Especially the decrease of uh, costs for computing and data storage over the last decade paved the way for breakthrough of deep learning methods. So what kind of uh, necessary things do we need if we want to apply AI to our problems? You can see it here on the right hand side. Uh, we assume that there is uh, patterns existing in the data. We need obviously data uh, for the problem and uh, we know uh, almost nothing or only just a very cumbersome model for the problem at hand. So over the last year, we had intense discussions uh, internally at, at m, m networking, but also together with our partners from academia and industry where to apply AI within the glass industry. And we uh, identified mainly three fields, which you can see here, which is AI for production control, AI for architecture and engineering, and obviously AI for facades. So in the next slides, I just have the time to present some flagship applications uh, developed by us. So let's start with the pummel test, which you may be familiar with. The pummel test is executed with a hammer on a glass laminate to qualify basically the level of adhesion of an interlayer to the glass. Typically, the pummel test is conducted by a human and the evaluation into one of the pummel classes uh, is done by visual inspection of the resulting uh, hammered glass. Uh, in order to overcome this uh, individual human bias on the pummel classification, uh, we developed a 3D deep learning classification tool, which you can see as a schematic here. And uh, this takes as an input the pummel uh, pictures after the test and predicts one of the classes. Here is an example application of our tool. Uh, what is uh, very impressive is the accuracy which we reach with uh, our tool, which is very high for the majority of classes. And hence, we could provide a reliable, repeatable, and fast and objective pummel evaluation tool for the future use in quality assurance. The next example I want to present to you is again from production control and uh, it deals with prediction of the cutting edge uh, glass strength prediction. Uh, here is a, a grinding machine, a cutting machine, and uh, here is a, a big list of, of parameters and uh, uh, glass strength with, which we obtained. And the idea here was to train a machine learning algorithm to predict actually this glass strength independence of the glass cutting parameters. Uh, what we found is there is a strong correlation and uh, we could for the first time provide a model for this uh, using machine learning. And hence uh, in future, it will be um, uh, possible to uh, distinguish between um, significant and insignificant parameters for this uh, important process. The most recent and uh, yet most um, exciting research is concentrating on the use of deep learning methods as alternatives for computational mechanic techniques, such as the finite element methods, which you can see on the left-hand side to solve, for example, a plate bending problem, as you can see here, or if you look at the right-hand side pictures as an alternative for complicated material models, such as for hyperelasticity for uh, TSSA silicons. 
Finally, I think uh, one of the most um, promising future trends of AI is the application to cyber physical facade systems. Um, here, the idea is to establish a control and steering circuit for the whole building unit where the uh, AI collects data via sensors or user feedback to actually learn over time about the well being and the satisfaction of the user. Uh, independence of the outside and inside conditions of that building, such as humidity, sun, and ventilation. We believe that uh, with this approach, a real user-centered and intelligent building will be reached uh, in the future. Yeah, as my time is uh, very limited, uh, I will come back to my initial uh, question. Uh, if you think that the glass industry is ready for AI and vice versa, and I think, uh, given what I presented to you, uh, for me and my partner, uh, Michael Drasse, it is clear that we say, yes, uh, the glass industry is ready for AI. And we already showed with some examples that uh, it is possible to, to apply to problems. And as a fun fact, we took these two 2D photos and generated 3D photos using an AI algorithm from Facebook, maybe as a nice gimmick uh, to the end. And yeah, with the last slide here, you can see some references and our partners, which we uh, want to thank at uh, this point for the trust and valuable discussions and ideas. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to reach either my uh, partner, Dr. Dras, or me anytime. And I thank you again for your attention and the interest, and uh, I hope you have an interesting afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, uh, this was uh, very inspiring, and uh, yeah, I hope it will be the ideas will be picked up uh, by the community. I hope so. I hope so. Um, Thank you. Yeah, questions will come uh, at the end. Uh, so after all pitches, uh, so um, let's move on now first to the to the next uh, talk. Um, the next talk is also uh, quite inspiring and uh, and uh, yeah, let's say uh, nice for the for the imagination of uh, most of us. Um, it's about the structural glass, which is used in super yacht applications. Um, the, uh, the specific uh, paper here will be presented by Mr. Cosmas uh, Mupa Hitsulu uh, from, from Eckersley O'Callaghan. Um, Cosmas is a structural engineer with a Master of Engineering from the National Technical University of Athens and also a Master of Science in Structural Steel Design from Imperial College in London. He is uh, currently working as an associate in the Glass and Complex Envelopes Group at Eckersley O'Callaghan, and he is responsible for the analysis and the design of innovative glass structures worldwide. He has been a member of the Yard Glass ISO Group since 2016, where he helps to develop structural glass design standards required by this industry. So Cosmas, the floor is yours. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, great. Uh, so basically, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So the aim of this presentation is basically to describe the principles behind uh, structural glass design in super yacht uh, applications. So yacht designers were inspired by the achievements and developments of structural glass in architectural industry and wanted to adapt this in, uh, in their designs. However, there are some fundamental differences between uh, the two main structures, the hull of a ship and the building. And because of these differences, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to get this transition from architectural uh, glass to yacht glass without having challenges. So some of these are that the sea obviously is like a harsh environment. Uh, in case of an emergency, it's very difficult um, people to, to evacuate the vessels or help to, to arrive quickly. Glass provides weather and water tightness, uh, which actually prevents, it from, prevents the vessel from capsizing or sinking. Also, pressures and superstructure movements are particularly high. We are talking here pressures, a typical pressure is 15 kPa, and we can get easily more than uh, 100 kPa in particular locations of the sea the expectations of the clients are even higher. And um, in some locations, the visual quality of the glass is important, not only for aesthetics, but because, uh, for example, at the bridge deck, uh, it, 
it's necessary for the safe navigation of the vessel. So uh, the, the flag states and the classification societies in yacht industry are like building control uh, authorities in architectural industry. So they review and approve yacht designs. Uh, in the past, in order to uh, get an approval for a non-standard glass configuration, we had to do expensive and time-consuming tests, pressure tests like the one on the right. Luckily, with ISO 11336, uh, this, uh, this is not the case anymore. So this standard, which is uh, the main yacht, main, uh, yacht glass design standard, um, provide guidelines to design pressure uh, and uh, obviously the glass. However, they only recommend two glass types, fully tempered glass and chemically toughened glass. And for both these two glass types, the glass strength uh, we have to use is only 40 MPa, regardless, regardless the type. So basically you can see here a very conservative approach that focuses mainly on the strength of glass to prevent failure and not that much um, on, on the best foiler performance of the, um, of the panel. Interlayers, we can basically use all kinds of interlayers, but obviously I know marine interlayers are recommended because like a centric glass, because they are less susceptible to delamination due to water ingress. And one of the most important topics in yacht glass design is connections to main structures. So the main, the main assumption here is that the glass infinitely stiff and um, the, the structure that connects to behind can move uh, uh, by a lot. And this movement is accommodated by the adhesive, which is not a structural silicon in, um, in, in marine industry. It is uh, prohibited to, to avoid contamination of the substrate and failure of the paint. Um, but it is mainly poly polyurethane and uh, solid modified uh, polymers. Obviously, the aim, uh, as you can imagine, in order to optimize the performance of the vessel is to reduce uh, the weight. And the ISO 11336 uh, only provides some simplified formulas for flat for side supported panels. Uh, most of the yards are using these uh, equations these days, but if we want to achieve the actual um, uh, optimization of the glass weight, we need to use FEA and nonlinear geometry analysis to take into account the exact shape, the exact geometry of the panel and um, also the membrane action that is developed uh, at its deformed condition. Have also in mind that we are talking about 100 kPa loads in some cases, so membrane action will be activated. And the next two slides is uh, just to quickly to go through some of the design challenges that we usually meet um, when we design glass in super yachts. So thermal performance is quite an important topic these days. And um, in order to reduce the U value, we can use insulated glass units. But in this, in this situation, we need to have a step, a step unit in order to be able to, to have the glue uh, only at the structural part of the IGU. To reduce the value, we can uh, use uh, high performance coatings and colored PVBs. Uh, but obviously, when you have chemically toughened glass, no coatings are allowed by default due to the thin compression zone of the glass. So uh, we simply add an annealed glass, which is decorative, has decorative purposes, and it has also a coating there. As I've mentioned, visual quality is very important. So uh, we need to uh, develop a bespoke specification, uh, much more tight than in architectural industry. And uh, at the end, um, we need to inspect uh, one by one every single panel to, to make sure that it can meet these requirements. Uh, curved glass is quite a challenge also in super yachts, particularly when it combined with coatings because there are several limitations there. So all the methods that uh, are already uh, well known in architectural industry can be adapted. Uh, of course, cold bend glass is not recommended due to the high bending strengths is already uh, induced uh, there. And together the 40 MPa limit, this is uh, not an option. Underwater windows is the, the latest trend. Uh, their design is uh, focusing mainly on robustness 
and most of the um, uh, authorities that check the design um, simply recommend to, to, to double the calculated glass thickness. Obviously, you end up with thicknesses like this on the, um, the right-hand side, uh, where you have 18 plies, um, 8 millimeters thick of fully toughened glass. Um, obviously, this is a quite stiff panel uh, with reduced effective thickness. Oops. And the last, um, the last uh, slide basically is simply to show that apart from uh, super yachts, glass is becoming popular also in other uh, sectors of marine industry, like cruise ships. So Iona Sky Dome is a grid cell glass roof that we designed and has been recently installed uh, at the top uh, deck of, um, of a PNO cruise ship. Thank you very much. Okay, Cosmas, uh, thank you. Uh, also quite inspiring. Um, there are some questions for you later on. Um, our next talk is a, a topic which we selected because we think it's uh, generally important uh, yeah, in, in terms of uh, reducing, uh, let's say, uh, the footprint and uh, let's say, uh, heading more towards uh, recycled glass, for example. So the, the title of the next uh, uh, talk will be the investigation uh, of a flexural strength of recycled cast glass. And um, the presentation will be held by Ms. Telesila Bristogiani from Delft University uh, of Technology. Uh, she is a researcher there uh, working on her, at her uh, PhD at the TU Delft Glass Group. And uh, she is generally studying the structural potential of cast glass. Together with her colleague, uh, Faidra Ikonomopoulou, uh, uh, she has been involved in the Chrysal Houses facade research and the follow-up glass project for which they have received multiple engineering awards and nominations. You may remember also four years ago at the Challenging Glass 5 um, conference here in Ghent also that uh, Faidra was presenting about this project. And um, now Telesila's PhD work on the strength, uh, defects and uh, mesostructure of recycled uh, cast glass is expected to be completed at the end of this year. So we are expecting a quite mature pitch quite uh, coming uh, up right now. So Telesila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, for the introduction and also for the opportunity to talk about uh, an unexplored potential in the recycling industry. So let me see. Yeah, so glass is a fully recyclable material, but it's not a fully recycled material. So actually, pretty much what you see in this glass bucket, apart from a glass bottle, currently that gets downcycled or landfilled due to recipe mismatch or contamination. But this beautiful glass could become an, an uh, interesting and robust building component. So actually what we do at TU Delft is that we take the waste that actually no one wants and we recast it in our kiln in order to understand the properties, but also the potential of becoming a new product. So we work with a range of different glasses from oven doors and car windshields and Pyrex trays, like even the old television screens. And we try different shapes of pallets and different sizes, but also low forming temperatures in order to get interesting organized or random structures in our glass. And then what we do is that we study the defects and the best structures that we get in order to link them to the raw material that we used and also the casting, for, casting properties that we have applied, so the thermal history in order to understand how these defects are formed, but more importantly, how we can control them or even avoid them. And then we test our specimens in four-point bending to get a grip of their flexural strength and their stiffness, but also to understand which was this critical flow that actually led them to failure. So if you would look at the flexural strength results, you would see that there are three main zones. So the more pure glass, glasses that we have tested over here they had the higher strength, so between 50 and 70 megapascal, and they failed mainly due to a machining damage. The more contaminated series, on the other hand, had a bit of a lower strength between 30 and 50 megapascal, and they failed mainly due to a stone occlusion or a bubble in their surface. And finally, the samples that we have done in a lower temperature, so the fused ones, they failed at low values as even 10 megapascal, and that was mainly due to their fused crystalline interlay. So we saw, that for example, for the less pure series, the defects that we would get 
from the contamination were really the strength limiting flow. While in the more pure specimens, then the glass composition was really starting to play. And then we would see a range of properties. And more importantly, we would see that, for example, the highest young modulus would not necessarily mean the highest flexural strength. And why is that? Because we realized that some glasses with a very strong atomic bond, but a lower atomic packing density, they had more space around the flow to deform, and then eventually they would fail at much higher stress. And we also saw how critical the casting temperature can be. So of course, the higher the temperature, the more homogeneous and the more strong the component will be. But look how dramatically the strength will drop in the lower, lower casting temperatures in these specific fused samples, where actually the crystalline interlayers were exposed to the zone of the maximum tensile stress. But it's interesting to see that the same crystalline interlayers that were interfering so much with the strength were doing absolutely nothing to the strength when they were situated in the middle, so in the bulk of the material. Also notice that only 50 degrees of difference can have a big impact in the strength. And all of these two beams over here look exactly the same. They have the, the second one, due to this very subtle defect, due to the higher casting viscosity, failed at a lower strength. So actually what we understand from this study is that yes, glass is a very valuable resource and it actually leads to a great variety of mechanical properties, but also very interesting aesthetical expressions. But more importantly, if you start thinking that the defects in the bulk are not that critical anymore, then we can start envisioning composite glasses, where you can have a strong, pure zone only when it's really required, and we can fill up the rest of the space with a glass of a lower grade, the one that actually no one wants. And we could also envision the different, a different way, really engineering inside of our glasses weaker zones in terms of crystalline interfaces or even subtle bubble veils in a way that we can have a very predictable failure. So actually the possibilities are really vast. We still keep on being surprised and really fascinated with what comes out of our glass, glass bakery every time. And it really convinces us more and more that the landfill is really not the place to be for this valuable glass waste. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Telesila. Um, okay, we have one more pitch to go. Um, the next uh, and final uh, presentation will be about uh, a real project. Uh, we thought also that it is, uh, in the end, what, what all this knowledge serves for. So, um, yeah, I think we have an, uh, um, also an, uh, let's say an inspiring one coming up. It will be presented by Mr. Uh, Roman Schieber. Um, Roman Schieber, he leads the Knippers Helbig Facades team in Stuttgart and also in, uh, in New York. Um, his association to structural engineering, environmental design, and also deep knowledge of the latest fabrication techniques allow him to, to transfer structural efficiency and thermal performance into uh, facade design. The center aspiration of his work is to create a, a balanced link between architectural motivated and performance driven design. His portfolio includes projects like the Museum of the Fine Arts in Houston, the Harvard Science and Engineering Complex, uh, the Toronto Courthouse, and of course, the iconic spherical shell of the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in, in Los Angeles, which will be the topic of his presentation right now. So Roman, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, many thanks for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, in the coming minutes, I'm going to present and give an overview about the um, design and engineering of the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. So one slide back. So on such a project, you can imagine that there's many, many different parties involved, just to mention some of the key players. The design architect is Renzo Piano Building Workshop. The executive architect is Gensler. We had uh, Gardner as the facade contractor and uh, two of my uh, co-speakers, Wim Stevens from Eastman was providing the interlayers and Francis Ceres was uh, with uh, Saint-Gobain was providing the glass and many other parties, of course. So um, the actual museum is uh, adjacent to the uh, yeah, iconic dome building. We have this solid body with a 1,000 uh, seat uh, theater uh, inside and uh, yeah, we designed and engineered 
this um, steel glass grid shell structure above and around um, the solid body, let's say. So these are some of the initial concept sketches um, where you can see the, yeah, the basic concept with a steel grid, some curved steel tubes, secondary steel members, um, some uh, secondary structure holding up the glazing and a cable bracing structure with twin cable bracings, making the steel grid a structural shell structure. Yeah. So these are as-built details, um, how the end result basically looked like. You see here again the steel uh, grid structure, the cable bracings and the hidden dead load support for the glass, um, which is supporting the inner of the two um, yeah, laminated glass panes. Yeah. So, um, of course, yeah, structural concept. It's a longer story, but we had to develop a structural concept to make it to make it short. This shell structure had a uh, yeah, it's it's dead load support a bit a bit above the equator with some diagonal struts. We had these grid members, the diagonal bracing mem members, making it a, a shell structure. So that was the basic concept. Um, yeah, we had these. The cables making it a, a shell structure, not going too deep into the, the actual analysis. Um, what was an interesting aspect was um, that, I mean, it's a super lightweight, um, weak structure. We had asymmetric forces due to wind, due to seismic. Um, so we had to deal with these uh, rhombic distortion effects. And we found out in our structural analysis that we had a displacement of up to 22.3 millimeters while just having a, a, a frame bite of uh, something around 12 and a half millimeters. So we built a racking mock-up and just had to check if the actual frame bite, the glazing system works without, yeah damaging the glass in a worst case scenario. Um, yeah, as this is a glass conference, I thought it's maybe <laughs> good also to talk a bit about the glass design. Um, we had a relatively um, conservative approach that was uh, coordinated with the city of Los Angeles. We, we, we were calculating the glass, which is basically two sides supported, yeah, with a point load of 150 kilograms, just on four by four centimeters under 60 degrees Celsius. and yeah, I had to prove uh, in a test that in a broken condition, the glass is not, uh, that the weight is not falling through, that the glass is not cracking. And yeah, by far we exceeded these requirements. Also thanks to the structural PVB inner layer we were using. Um, just to give you an impression of the fabrication and also pre-assembly of the structure, the entire structure was uh, constructed and designed with a zero, zero tolerance, not a single millimeter of to tolerances anywhere. So it had to fit perfectly. It was checked with templates in the factory here. On the right hand side, you see these prefabricated steel ladder frames. Um, yeah, this is basically what has been shipped from Europe to the United States to Los Angeles. And on the next slide here, you see how the installation began, starting at the base with these prefabricated letters, some intermediate members in the second step. Then there was a full scaffold on the roof terrace of the dome with the same letter frames um, being supported on the, um, on the scaffold, um, yeah, moving downwards and the lower part moving upwards until it became a full structure. One of the most critical parts um, during construction was the pretensioning of the cables. Um, it had to be done in an, in an absolute 100% symmetric way. You can imagine when you start applying forces on the cables that you would immediately distort the entire lightweight shell structure. So that was a very clear plan which was developed together with Gartner. We from the engineering side, they're more, more from the installation perspective. Um, and we, yeah, we had to, yeah, check all these installation sequences um, to be sure that it works. Then the next next interesting uh, step was the re releasing the structure. I mean, once once the, the the cables have been tensioned and the cable clamps have been tightened, it was basically a stiff shell, and then the scaffold had been released. So there was survey was really important. We had geometry data which has been, had been frequently checked. We had geometry basically when the shell structure was still on the scaffold. We had geometry data when it was released from the scaffold. Interesting to see that in some of the locations, it was sagging down due to dead load by, I think it was in the range of two, two and a half inches, six, centi six seven centimeters. And we had to com compare this with our structural analysis, which was very close to the 
results we found what gave us the confidence that everything should be all right and so we could proceed so glass installation was the next and kind of the, the final step just to give you an idea the weight of the glass is twice as heavy as the weight of the steel so it was also very important to install in a in a very symmetric way starting at the apex at the highest point moving downwards more or less in circles to apply the fo the forces in a in a symmetric way that was a, yeah an interesting moment i remember when when i was on site and found that some of the cables just were slack because of the weight which was just asymmetrically on the roof but when the installation proceeded they yeah got tensioned again and everything was all right yeah some more glazing details and uh, yeah this is the end result the steel glass part is finished the project should be opened to public in early 2021 thank you for your attention thank you very much roman for this uh, presentation of a very fascinating project and Maybe if everything goes well, we will be able to travel again by the beginning of 2021 and we can actually go and see this very nice project. So this presentation was the last one of our uh, author pitches. Um, I hope you've uh, had a um, good impression of um, what is in the proceedings and it's really only the tip of the iceberg. So I encourage you to also have a look at the rest of the papers. Um, so now we move on to the uh, Q&A section and maybe some discussions. We have a lot of questions for, uh, for, for all the presenters. So I'm just going to see how much we can tackle in, um, in, the, coming, uh, uh, in the coming minutes. Um, and I'm just going to you know, shuffle around a little bit from one presenter to the other. I uh, just want to say to the other, um, uh, to, to the other presenters, um, if you want to comment on something in particular, if you also have some, some experience with it, please um, uh, let us know, raise your hand or just uh, butt in and then uh, we can get some of uh, some discussion going. So really, uh, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm randomly starting. Um, uh, first question for uh, Cosmas. Um, that's about uh, the finite element modeling. It's always an, uh, an issue with complex uh, material behavior, particularly of uh, adhesive, adhesives. Uh, there, there are two questions, one from Bay Jongepier, who is asking, um, do you take into account the flexibility of the glue or do you assume a rigid body support uh, in your finite element calculations? And uh, another question that I think is related to it from Mehmet Kiza is did you model the uh, polyurethane adhesive in the models? And if so, how did you model it? Could you, could you comment on that? Uh, yes. You can switch on your camera and then uh, we okay, great. get a face to your uh, name. I, I cannot, the host needs to uh, allow me. I cannot turn it on. We ask those in the meantime, just so, uh, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so uh, regarding the flexibility of the support, um, yeah, we do model it not that much for the for the glass design. So usually all of these panel we take all of these panels say independently more or less. Uh, so the flexibility of the support is important mainly for the for the addition uh, because the glass panel is subjected, let's say, to 15, 20 kPa is deforming a lot. So uh, this in plane uh, forces that are developed needs to be allowed for the um, for the design of the polyurethane. So we need to we need to mod model that flexibility. And uh, regarding um, the other question, yeah, and the, the way we model it is usually by um, using connection elements like springs. That, that's the the method they're using. Of course, in more detailed configurations, we can go to brick elements, but uh, that's the extreme scenario. So but that means that if in, that's in your analysis of the glass panels, you you model the supporting adhesive as a, as, as a spring support, for instance, or another kind of interface support? With spring uh, supports and stiffness in three directions, yes. Yeah, well, uh, if it's really about when you need to focus on the, uh, the, the loads on or the stresses on the adhesive itself, then then the, only then comes a moment to do a real full three-dimensional analysis of the focus on the uh, uh, on the adhesive. Exactly. I mean, basically, you do you can do a simple check using the even the spring elements. Uh, 
you have the stiffness in three directions, you get reactions in these three directions, you can do an initial estimation, which is usually enough because the strength provide the strengths provided by the adhesive manufacturers are quite conservative. So this would be more than okay for the design of the PU. A separate check needs also to happen in, to induce the movements of the vessel in the design of the um, adhesive. So the thickness of the adhesive needs to be such to accommodate these movements. Mm -hmm. Like a separate check. Right, yeah, okay. Thanks. So just a, a, a brief uh, note uh, to all panelists. Uh, this moment, you don't be shy and you can turn on your cameras. I think, I think it uh, gives a little better uh, idea of who we're dealing with. So thanks. So that's uh, nice to, to know to, who we're talking to. Um, and also good for the attendees, I think, to see you. Um, next question that uh, that is coming up uh, is um, or has come up has to do with the uh, the project that Chris Notenboom and Iris Rombouts uh, presented. But uh, I think kind of similar issues might be in play at the uh, the, the project in Los Angeles that uh, um, was presented by Roman has to do with the um, with the tight tolerances. Uh, so it was mentioned that. Uh, there were very tight tolerances, but that is uh, still a qualitative approach. Um, Isabel Schultz are asked, um, how tight are those tight tolerances during production, which were men mentioned by Iris? And kind of maybe similar question was to Roman Schieber was, Roman um, mentioned, uh, Michael Drossen noticed this, um, that the structure had zero tolerance or was it was required to build to a zero tolerance and the question is then um is it really possible to build to zero tolerance but maybe i can give first the word to iris to to respond to uh to this issue of tolerances in this uh facade okay thank you um yeah you can imagine that we needed to combine the complex shape of the glass and the shape of the stainless steel so we discussed a lot about the tolerances in the corner details um the glass we could not adjust, uh, adjust but the stainless steel we could and so in the end we made it to combine these two materials in the in the corner detail to plus minus one millimeter okay Okay, so that's actually a very clear uh, answer. Um, but um, I was wondering, Roman, could you also respond to the the question about tolerances in the uh, in the yeah. dome that that you've been sure. working on? So yeah, so so first of all, we required the facade contractor to build it with zero tolerances. <laughs> so oh, uh, so that's that? <laughs> that's that's the uh, the way it, it worked. But uh, yes, that's basically possible. I mean, every single surface, every joint uh, has been machined and it has been pre-assembled in the factory to check that it, it finally works. But t tolerances is, I mean, it's um, what, what, is a, what is a perfect geometry? I mean, when the sun is shining on the left side, it expands there and it's, it's, uh, it shrinks on, on the cold side. So there were strange effects that when you do the permanent field measuring, that uh, you get different geometry data during the day just due to the temperature changes. So sometimes it's uh, just the members didn't fit together during installation. So you had to come back later when it was colder and, and the members could be jointed together. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. But then um, how do you deal with that? I mean, doesn't that then the when it, you, you it, it breathed, the entire structure breathe time and then doesn't it break or, or get damaged when it is getting warm again or, or the other way around? I mean, but the entire system is is uh, designed to breathe. I mean, if if you have members which are just expanding, it, it, it it's it's a flexible structure. It moves it moves all the time. So it's just designed to move and to to be able to right. expand. Yeah, that's that's key to success. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and what do you do exactly to make that movement possible? I it, I think it's it starts just with a structural system with a. A spherical shell which just has some some posts back to the superstructure so if it expands it's just uniformly expands and changes it's it's it slightly changes the angles relative to the superstructure this is how it works and we have cables and it distorts all the time yeah okay thanks then i want to go to a completely different topic and question for telesela 
uh, under, under cost class. Um, and the question from Claudio Marini is, how do you achieve that regular meso structure with hexagonal pattern in your cost class samples? Could you yes. explain something about that? Yes, of course. So we actually cast with uh, rather high viscosities. This means that uh, we, we remain the, sorry, the shape memory of the callep still remains in our glass. So actually, this means that in the specific uh, glass, the hexagon one, we used rods for silicate rods that we have positioned them inside of a mold and we slowly heated it up. So then this created a hexagon pattern that you see in this uh, structure. So if we would have used another shape and a different temperature, we would have had a different result mm -hmm. because exactly we keep the shape memory of the original color. And, and maybe related to that, and I was wondering also maybe if, if uh, Shikara could maybe also join in on that. Is it possible to, or how could you, can you influence the viscosity of, of cast glass or, or printable glass? And how would you, would you do that? Um, but that, I mean, if you can play with that, then you can also influence your tolerances and, and the shapes that you achieve. So Shikara, could you... Could you say something about that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, in our case, uh, we ended up using uh, a type of solar line glass uh, that is specifically fine tuned for glass growers, uh, which means that it's, it has slightly longer working range and, and, and additional sort of uh, uh, values such as like brightness and, the, and refractivities. Uh, so what that means is that uh, we can always add more flux and additives as we, as we need to control the uh, uh, temperatures and viscosities. Um, so uh, depending on the type of uh, uh, recycled glass currents, uh, we can further fine tune for specific needs. Um, the challenge is that uh, uh, we won't be able to mix unknown uh, uh, unknown currents together because then it, 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 you know, we won't be able to control the viscosity and also it, uh, uh, it induced the um, sort of impurity in the glass and air bubbles and so on. So, so it's important to know the source, but then uh, we have an opportunity to further fine tune. And then Telesla, how do you feel about this uh, issue? So actually, yes, because we have been working with different glasses, uh, we see also a different range of viscosities. So that's why I was seeing a Chikara's glass and I thought, ah, this glass melts really nicely because it has <laughs> a higher content of soda and it has a little bit of boron and some other barium and other elements. And I thought these were also the glasses we had, that they were melting really nicely at a much lower temperature. And sometimes what we were doing is that we were mixing a little bit of these glasses, the ones that had lead or barium in there, with a soda lime glass, and then that would drop a little bit to the melting temperature. But what we also saw was that the different color would also affect how easy the glass would melt. So we saw that darker colors, they would homogenize much faster. So it also has to do with the color because it just heats up faster and then uh, it, it changes the way that it works. And, and yeah. something that I was, I'm just wondering if it springs to mind, because I know you've been working with a lot of different glass compositions as well, but would this be something that AI would also be applicable to? Um, maybe Michael Krauss, could you, mm -hmm. could you yeah, respond sure. to that? Is this something, is this a field where this might be? Um, yeah, actually it is. And uh, yeah, once our paper is out, we will have exactly an example for that. <laughs> to uh, predict the um, viscosity based on a machine learning approach where uh, it was not a project by us, but uh, it recently was uh, published um, where they used a big database to predict viscosity of uh, several kinds of glasses, uh, depending on the, the fractions of certain chemical components. Uh, and yeah, they managed basically to um, accelerate this uh, process of uh, providing new glass formulations um, based on an existing database. So uh, this is already in use in industry. Uh, I don't think that it is very like common knowledge that it is already used because I mean this is a monetary and economic uh, advantage of that that company, and uh, uh, I cannot uh, tell which company it is because other sponsors are here. <laughs> but uh, you, if you have a look at our paper, you will uh, find exactly that uh, that example. Okay. where uh, AI was used or machine learning was used uh, to mine basically a databases of chemical compounds to come up with a model for predicting viscosity and other 
um, things like glass transition temperature. Yeah. Oh, this is uh, yeah really cool uh, application. So there's yeah. some more questions on on uh, on AI and machine learning. Uh, uh, one is coming from Mauro Overend. Uh, mm -hmm. More general question: He's asking, what are the principal challenges that you foresee in the uptake of AI in the glass industry, or in the wider construction sector? Yeah. Um, so um, AI for I would start with the civil engineering and and basically break down to glass industry and then buildings or this single window. Um, for us, AI is uh, interpreted as a like a multi-scale problem, because uh, if you um, look into newspapers or what uh, latest research proposals are concerned with is uh, that you have uh, or the use of AI um, on the scale of kilometers or cities uh, when it comes to smart cities, right? And this uh, IoT, Internet of Things approach, uh, where they try, so there's a, a big US um, research now going on how to use AI for the storage or prediction of energy demand, uh, which is coupled to what we presented with the intelligent home on a, on a really like small scale for the individual user. And uh, there is an interaction uh, like uh, on this different kind of scales. Uh, but there is almost no theoretical foundation of how to formulate that learning problem. So at the moment, this is formulated as a big data problem where like a lot of uh, research, researchers try to gather data from uh, power providers, for example, and they try to learn about patterns in that. But in my eyes, this is a way too short uh, approach because uh, when you come from systems modeling and systems engineering, you know, for example, every civil engineer and architect knows uh, structural dynamics. You have this um, uh, vibrances, this uh, up swinging of, of a structure, and mathematically the same happens in a big grid. So uh, when you go alone with the data, I, I believe that AI will not solve or foresee such things because as long as you ignore this multi-scale problem of like steering the big city but not caring about the individual house, which has some interactions in the power grid, for example. Um, AI alone, I think, will not will not help here. But uh, I think we have to use here a more systematic approach. Um, yeah, this this is one one vision. And uh, when it comes to our glass structures and facades, I think we will see uh, a lot of uh, more uh, research in the directions of parametric architecture because this is the most structural thing <laughs> which AI is capable of dealing with the pattern of that. Um, actually, I have a, a research proposal on that uh, granted where we try to use structural um, yeah, uh, verification, not finite element method, but AI to solve uh, structural verification, but on the other hand, using a parametric model for architecture and to trying to yeah, get something like Spotify for buildings where you can say, oh, I like this color and I like this shape, and then it predicts some a kind of, of style and design for for your facade, uh, which comes handy because you accelerate, uh, which is the next point, accelerate um, design verification and production mm -hmm. with AI. So okay. here is the, is the biggest fear. Uh, do I get rid of the civil engineer and the architect? And uh, we say uh, this is a clear no, because uh, as far as we are concerned, we, we have planned it to set it up in a collaborative way. So the AI suggests the design, says structural verification is okay, economics is okay, ecology is okay, uh, but you can make choices like in your playlist in Spotify. Uh, I think this is very important to, to keep that uh, when it comes to AI because maybe you know that uh, Facebook tried to train AI for uh, being a chatbot and uh, like after one hour it was racist <laughs> yeah. and, uh, we don't want to have our uh, ai in the facade system to produce designs which nobody wants to have because then we, we obviously did something wrong yeah i think um, it's, well, the, it's the, yeah. the big challenges of ai is yeah. on, it's, on, it's, it's on the one hand the quality that you you're not exactly steering what's going on but it's also a little bit might be a risk or a, a downside if you also don't know exactly what is going on in this in this yeah. uh, neural network. Um, 
Uh, I think so. Recently, there is a big uh, research direction of explainable AI, but uh, I read some books of, of uh, physics guys, physics professors, and philosophers. Uh, they say it maybe the human being is too dumb to understand what AI does. <laughs> so uh, this is almost a philosophical question. Uh, if we really are capable of, of understanding really what, what it, uh, AI is doing. Um, I, I just want to, to add another point, which I think for industry is, is very important. That, maybe uh, a last one, if I may. Uh, yeah, last one. Uh, digitalization and uh, digitalization of process is very important because uh, we have a saying that AI works on bits, not on paper plans. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, all the terms like BIM models, industry 4.0, they are important. And as long as they are not in place, we cannot have AI work on paper plans. So as long as you have your structural drawings printed and not a digital, digital model for that, as, yeah, in that case, AI is, is having problems to, to really work with that. And uh, yeah, as I said, this costs money. And I think therefore this is in, uh, relevant for industry. Uh, so I think some um, yeah. interesting insights into the future. I have just a, a couple of more practical questions for uh, for um some other authors which are the more short questions for uh, iris and chris there's uh, they there's some interest in what kind of glass was used it, was it cold bent and what type of glass was used uh, Greg, thanks yeah i'll just answer quickly i also posted that then in the chat so just to make it visible for everybody but oh, it, right, yeah. so we we used a uh, low iron annealed uh, and then hot bent so not cold bent glass so okay was, uh, and another question that came specifically to you, very detailed question, I think, how did you deal with stress singularities in the silicon calculation? Or did you have any stress singularities? Yes, yeah, so, so what we did to, to check the, 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 the connection, the adhesive also, so we started with like very, uh, very, sim very simple. So we just checked and you can also read it in the paper, sort of the direct load path, sort of, a, a, just a bit of the, we only used a bit of the silicon to check stresses being transferred or force being transferred and then stresses and then we use sort of regular design criteria so 0.14 MPA for Dow Corning 993 we also had contact with Dow Corning um, and then we had like various material models um, to, to investigate those stresses so we, we made some uh, comparisons uh, about stresses in the sealant and so you see some graphs in the paper uh, what material models we exactly uh, may use to investigate those stresses. Okay, thank you. Then I have maybe some question more for uh, uh, Roman Schieber. Iannis uh, Katsivalis is asking, considering the harsh environment of the sea or near the sea, do you take in con into consideration the possible diffusion of seawater into the glass uh, adhesive interface? Isn't, is that for Cosmos? Or yeah, is it seems for... so. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah it's for me. It's for... Well, actually, um, in my list, I'm not sure. It's for you. Maybe it's. So the museum is a few miles away from the sea, so. It's maybe not so much of a heavy storm. Then to Cosmos, this could be even more relevant. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so basically, again, um, in our details, you always try the glass edges to be protected. Uh, but also, um, the, the interlayers we use um, must have some sort of like uh, proof, let's say salt spray tests that um, uh, can, can deal with, um, with, with um, these sort of conditions. And uh, regarding also the other question about uh, how do you ensure steel corrosion, um, we, we have a certain uh, painting type um, that can, can deal with this. And obviously, as you can imagine, the uh, regular maintenance um, is planned. So yeah, painting is the, the answer for the corrosion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, with that, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sad to say that I'm, I'm going to have to kind of stop this, the, the Q&A uh, part. There, are, uh, there have been a considerable more amount of questions that have been asked to the different uh, uh, presenters, but uh, yeah, due to the time, we unfortunately cannot treat all of them. Um, if you still have questions, or you, if you're a panelist and you have answers for the for that, in these, you might use uh, want to use the chat function to to type some answers, 
or um, well to the attendees i can also say uh, well look more in depth into the papers and usually the uh, contact email is there so you can also try to contact the author if you have some more specific uh, questions uh, to discuss um, I want to say a very big thank you to all our um, authors and presenters uh, for, for being here and, and uh, uh, also uh, being here to uh, answer and discuss all these questions. Um, and then we move on to the already the final part of this uh, webinar. Um, and uh, as uh, you may or may not know, the Challenging Glass Conference has been uh, collaborating with the uh, Springer Journal of Glass Structures and Engineering for a couple of years already, um, having uh, some special issues for the, for the conference. And um, that is also what uh, we uh, were able to do this time. I'm glad to say uh, that we could team up again with the journal uh, and that the journal could make a special issue uh, to uh, yeah, um, have some of the publications be expanded more in depth uh, um, on, on uh, the structural glass topics. Um, but the journal also has a, uh, an, uh, a yearly award um, and uh, that's not directly connected to the Challenging Glass Conference, but nevertheless, uh, I think it's a nice and suitable occasion that we use this uh, this congregation to uh, uh, to present the um, or to have uh, Natalie Jacobs from uh, from Springer to present the um, uh, best paper award uh, of the journal of 2019. Uh, so I'd like to ask Natalie if you are on the line and if you're here. And if so, please say some, something. Yes, I am online. Ah, good. Nice to hear you. So you should have control of the presentation now. And I would like to give the floor to you for the presentation of the Best Paper Award. OK, well, hello, everybody. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this virtual event. It's a pleasure to be here. And I've really enjoyed the keynote and the, and the pictures. Uh, my name is Natalie Jacobs, and I'm an executive editor at Springer. I'm based at the Springer office in Dordrecht in the Netherlands, and I've been working for Springer for more than 20 years. And I'm responsible for the publication of the journal Glass Structures and Engineering and another 20 journals. Um, you might know that Glass Structures and Engineering published its first issue in 2016. We started back then with two issues per year, and this year, 2020, we are publishing four issues. So the journal is growing steadily. The journal has five editors in chief, Jan Bellis, one of them, Christian Lauter, Jess Hendrik Lulten, Mauro Overend, and Jan Schneider. Um, journal is so-called hybrid journal, which means that after your paper is accepted, you the choice to publish either in the traditional way or with open access. And maybe also nice for you to know that the journal had uh, more than 40,000 downloads last year. And this year, only until the end of July, we already had more than 30,000 downloads. So it looks like we will approach the 100,000 downloads this year. Uh, currently, we have several special issues open for submissions, one on glass and extreme events, another one on glass projects and case studies, and one on glass design code. If you have ideas for any special issue for the journal, I would encourage you to contact us. And we are always looking for new topics, special or thematic issues. So now we move on to, um, let's see, if I can move to the next slide, no. Can somebody maybe help me to move to the next slide? Because I'm not able to do that. Because I'm happy to announce the winner of the 2019 Glass Structures and Engineering Best Paper Award. Um, this is a paper authored by Dr. Andreas Kasper. And the title of the paper is Spontaneous Cracking of Thermally Toughened Safety Glass, Part 3. Statistic evaluation of field breakage records and consequences for residual breakage probability. The topic of the paper is really important to the class community, both for the scientific and the practical class community. The prize consists of a certificate that you see on this slide. 
will be mailed to the winner as a PDF because I'm still working from home. And as soon as I'm back at the office, it will be uh, printed and sent to the author. Dr. Casper will also get one year free access to the journal and the 100 euro book voucher of Springer.com. We will also give four weeks free access to the paper and to part one, two, and four of the paper because there are more, more parts. Uh, free access will start as, to, as of today and we, we will of course announce this on our uh, social media channels. I would really like to congratulate um, Dr. Casper. I don't know if he is online, but I would like to congratulate you on behalf of the editors in chief, the editorial board of the journal, and of course, from your Springer team. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Natalie, for uh, presenting the, the best paper award of the Challenging Glass Journal. And also our uh, congratulations to Dr. Kasper of uh, winning this uh, prestigious award. Um, we have come more or less to the end of uh, our uh, Challenging Glass 7 webinar. So um, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your attendance. Um, I would like to thank a few people. Um, okay, so... Um, before I do that, I would like to remind you once more that uh, we have just uh, shown you a, a little piece of all the knowledge and all the nice projects which we actually uh, are offering you free of charge. You can uh, download uh, our conference proceedings from the, uh, from the website and uh, also there are links uh, to, let's say, the, the related articles in the Glass Structures and Engineering Journal. Okay. Um, If I can get to the next slide, I would like to thank the scientific committee members. Um, you see their names here displayed. They have done a tremendous nice work in reviewing all the papers and also suggesting uh, improvements so that we can offer the quality which we, which we like. Uh, so thank you very much, Paolo, Martina, Stefan, Jürgen, Jens, Mauro, Jens and Fred. Thank you very much. Um, so more people to thank are, of course, all the speakers and panelists of today. Uh, Francis Wim, Chikara, Chris, Iris, Michael, Cosmas, Telesila, Roman, and also Natalie. Thank you very much, very much from, uh, from our behalf. And uh, last but definitely not least, also once more, thank you very much to all our sponsors who made it possible for us to create this event and also uh, to, uh, to offer you uh, free of charge all our uh, proceedings online. Good. Having said that, I uh, thank you, of course, for attending. Um, we, uh, yeah, it is a very strange feeling for us here to, uh, to have organized this conference and standing here in front of almost an uh, empty room. Um, we hope next time it will be much different. Uh, and uh, we are really looking forward to meeting you again uh, in 2022 at the Challenging Glass 8 conference. Thank you very much. Enjoy the weekend and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.